Good evening, everybody, and welcome to History Indoors. Um, thank you very much for wherever you're tuning in from tonight. And please do leave a comment in the comment section right now to let uh, Tim and I know where you're watching from. So my name's Stephen. I'm um, a part of History Indoors. I've actually been there from uh, the very start, actually, um, and which was back in 2020 during the first lockdown. Uh, Michael, Michael Saul and Lewis Charles Smith, who are our founders, had the idea of during the first lockdown in the United Kingdom, whilst we were all stuck in our homes and people couldn't go out to um, listen to history talks, to bring it to your homes, to bring it online. And we've been going ever since. At first, we had weekly talks um, and we've always been free, always been online. And fast forward to now, three years later, we've been running for three whole years now. Um, we're still giving talks roughly on a fortnightly basis, sometimes more often, sometimes slightly le uh, less frequently. Um, we've moved to uh, live streaming on YouTube now, but you'll be able to find, if you go and look us up on YouTube, you're going to be able to find um, our back catalogue of over 100 talks. And altogether, we're approaching 300 videos, all to do with history. We've got historical film reviews, we've got short educational history videos, and we've got our talks which have always been and i presume going on into the future will always be the hallmark of history indoors um so tonight we've got uh tim gooch now tim has been part of history indoors for about a year now tim so yeah, right? over the year yeah and and tim uh, joined us um he is actually his background is english and he went to the university of exeter and got his master's in english there but he is also an avid historian now his first talk was about the Battle of Jutland, which was one of his other historical passions of World War One. But um, mine and Tim's friendship has certainly blossomed over the early medieval period. And <laughs> Tim went on to um, do a talk about the Icelandic sagas, blending his love of English and history together, or languages, shall I say, in history, if it's the Icelandic sagas. Um, and then his most recent talk was about Æthelflaed. But tonight, Tim's fast-forwarding slightly to the Battle of Malden. So thank you very much for all tuning in. Please do let us know in the comment section where you're tuning in from. Um, and at the end of the talk that Tim will give, there will be a chance to end, ask questions. So please do save your questions for the end and Tim will endeavour to answer those to the best of his ability. But you've uh, heard enough from me. I'm going to exit from the screen and I'm going to hand over to Tim now. Tim, take it away. Thank you. Hello everyone, thank you for coming along and thank you for listening in. So, the Battle of Maldon. So, on a clear day last year, 2022, I stood on the shore of the Blackwater, which is a river in Essex, across a tidal causeway, it's a place, a place called Northy Island, and sheltered up the inner estuary is a, is a small town of Maldon. And it was here on the 11th of August, 991, that Maldon earned its place in uh, the history of Britain. The Battle of Maldon that followed saw the destruction of the East Anglian feared, that's the local army raised in time of need, and the death of its leader, Earl Britnoth, Elderman of Essex at the hands of a Viking army. We know a surprising amount about the battle, thanks largely to a poem written to commemorate um, the battle by an anonymous English poet. It tells the epic and violent story of the battle itself and it assured Britnoth's place in history. As a work itself, the poem is a valuable window into England in the late 10th century. And so I'll be using that uh, text as a vehicle to kind of explore the background of the battle, the course of events and the aftermath. And I'll finish by exploring kind of how the, the beautiful language of the poem itself um, demonstrates the bond between a lord and his retainers, which was so critical to Anglo-Saxon England, the period that we're covering, as well as being an elegy for a world that was changing and a fitting tribute to Britnoth himself. So this period of history is called the Anglo-Saxon period. Uh, most of you uh, probably know between the fall of Rome and the coming of the Normans. But I will also be using the term Anglo-Scandinavian to talk about this nation, uh, England at that time, 
as after generations of settlement had resulted in a mixed population by the time of uh, the late 10th century, particularly in East Anglia, Northern Mercia, which is the Midland Kingdom, and Northumbria, the northern part of Britain, which, which had, uh, these had formed the Danelaw settlement at the time of King Alfred the Great. So this is one of those times when history intersects with a famous name or infamous name. Before I dive into the poem and the battle, I want to set the scene a little bit. So in 991, the United Kingdom of England and Galiland, the land of the Angles, it was barely 50 years old. Alfred the Great had laid the foundations in the previous century and his heirs, um, particularly his son, daughter and grandson, had realised his vision of a united England, culminating in King Athelstan, Alfred's grandson, his victory amidst the vast carnage at Brunaba in 937 an enormous battle in the north of England. Crowned King of England, his stepbrothers and nephews consolidated the kingdom, reaching its zenith with the reign of Edgar the Peaceful, grandson of Edward the Elder of Wessex, who was Athelstan's father. Edgar's 16-year reign was a high watermark of prosperity and peace, as he sought to heal the scars of a nation divided along an economic and religious and racial lines. However, following his death, there was a murky and contested succession in 978, and Ethelred ascended to the throne. This great-great-grandson of Alfred would achieve notoriety in history as Ethelred Undred, or the Unready. Uh, the subriquet translates as ill-counseled or badly counseled, which is a contemporary uh, mockery of his name, which means noble counsel, Ethelred. So kings in Anglo-Saxon England did not rule like the kind of absolute monarchies of medieval France or even practice primogeniture, that is the accession of the eldest firstborn legitimate uh, son or child. They ruled via a witan, or a ruling council, which was made up of um, the nobles and usually high churchmen of the uh, kingdom. Any male of sufficient age and experience of the royal family uh, or of competing royal families was eligible for the throne and they were referred to as athelings, meaning literally noble one. And it was the work of the Witan to choose from amongst competing athelings once a king died. Mm -hmm. There was often a great deal of kind of chicanery and power broking and sometimes violence. And this process became, this kind of violence became much more marked with Ethelred's accession to the throne his mother because he um he had what was called a might is what called a minority so he assumed the throne at a very young age and he was too young to assume the authority so his mother and whereas what we would call regents manipulated the young king to ensure their own power now the i've mentioned um the nobles on the council and they were mostly what were called eldermen and eldermen literally just means in old English older or senior man and they were the regional commanders of what are now in England and Britain called shires or counties. They were civil administrators, um, law and order, justice, tax, tithe but they were also military leaders. It was their responsibility to muster the feared that is the, the soldiers of their county in time of war. However the ex accession of a vacillating king could not have come at a worse time. For Britain was about to suffer um, a, f a huge wave of Viking raids, which escalated steadily because England was now supremely wealthy, cultured, and it possessed a sophisticated civil service, military and tax network. But through Ethelred's long reign, things went from bad to worse by a combination of bad judgment um, incompetence, bad faith, corruption, treachery and bad luck. Ethelred eventually lost his throne to Danish invaders. But at the time of the Battle of Melden, this young king was only 25. He was 13 years into a 35 year reign. A large Viking force had appeared off the coast of Kent and East Anglia. 
and Alderman Britnoth of Essex had raised his feared levies, mustered his household soldiers, and he trapped the enemy along the coast. The Viking army disembarked on Northern Island in Essex. Britnoth and his army approached the shore. His determination was that these raiders would pay in blood for the rapine and the slaughter they had unleashed on his people. So beneath the summer sun, these two armies prepared for battle. The Battle of Maldon would prove to be a pivot on which the history of England would turn, but unfortunately not for the reasons that Britnoth would have wished. So we will now go turn to the account itself, uh, the poem. So as a manuscript, uh, the Battle of Meldon, like so many old English works, survives almost by chance and coincidence, only thanks to a copy made in the 18th century, as the original was tragically destroyed in a fire. The version we have is, all, is also, it's incomplete. Um, tantalisingly, we, we lack probably about the first 50 lines and the last 100. So we lack the anonymous poet's opening and conclusion. Uh, which may have explained a lot about the setting and purpose of, of his work. The author's skill is self-evident, and the style is very typical of Germanic heroic poetry of the Anglo-Saxon type. In fact, it's kind of, it's ultra-typical, it's too typical. It's very self-consciously recreating this heroic mode in keeping with its subject matter. He's, the poet's deliberately hearkening back to Beowulf and these epic tales. England was becoming much more truly medieval, as we might think of it by then. Its court was becoming wealthier, more continental, more disconnected um, from the old values. And I'll explore, uh, be exploring these kind of later in my talk. So it's pray, the poet's praise of this kind of heroic, elegiac culture, warrior culture, is matched only by a really surprising level of tactical detail. So it's very unusual for the phases of a battle to be so minutely described in early medieval sources, which has led historians to think that the poet had access to first-hand information, perhaps even being a survivor of the battle. The poet's masterful control of metre and rhythm in Old English indicates that he was a trained storyteller, which was common at the time. And it's my unver unverifiable belief, I'll own that, that the poet was actually a member of Britnoth's household because he shows a very intimate knowledge, not only of Britnoth, but the soldiers who fought with him. So this brings us to the man at the heart of the drama, Britnoth himself. Uh, he was 68 when he fell in battle, which was a good age for the 10th century, but not completely unheard of. Kings Alfred, Edward and Ethelstan all died on or around their 50th year. So for Britnoth to be hale and hearty enough to lead his men in to battle was unusual, but not ridiculous. Uh, there's a common misconception um, that medieval life expectancy was catastrophically short. If you asked a random sample of people, they'd probably think, oh, people died at around 30. Uh, but this is where statistics can be misleading. It's true that the average life expectancy of every single person born was 30. But that includes infant mortality, which was tragically high in this period. There were obviously variances in terms of uh, class, health, century, cultural background. But as a general kind of uh, umbrella rule of thumb, you had about a 50% chance of reaching your fifth birthday in the, um, in the early medieval era. However, if you survived to the age of 10 and were unafflicted by a disease or death in war, living into your 60s was to be, or even 70s, was to be expected from a healthy person. A well-nourished, healthy aristocrat like Britnoth with an active life could well make it into 70 or beyond. Now, Britnoth had a very, um, very interesting, the, his life covers a very interesting time because he was 14 at the time of King Athelstan's victory at Brunaba. He was well enough he was old enough to remember it. So he'd been elderman for a long time. He was related to marriage, by marriage, to a previous king. His family was an old and respected one. In the Anglo-Scandinavian England of this 10th century, Ethelred's court was becoming, as I've said, truly medieval. 
steeped in intrigue and plotting and factional division. Ambitious and unscrupulous men, like Edric Strayana, took advantage of chaotic conditions and a weak king to line their pockets and build their own empires of influence. By contrast, with his sincere Christian faith and his long service, Britnoth appears almost like a member of the old guard. He likely longed for the England of his youth, strong, devout, and maintained by this kind of uh, Anglo-Saxon martial code of honour and the reciprocal relationship between Lord and sworn retainer. And he probably, I think, felt much more at home in the shield wall at Maldon, amongst men he had known all his life, than in the gossip and intrigue of a, a vacillating court. I mean, I'm taking a historical liberty, but uh, it's natural to think of Britnoth putting on his mail, his helm and his sword, thinking that an elderman's proper place was to stand between his people and their enemy, surrounded by men loyal to him and the values he represented. Also, um, unusually for a figure in the early medieval era, we have his physical remains. We have his skeleton to study. Uh, and we know that he was a physically huge guy. He was probably about, he was even as tall as six, seven or six, nine and broad across the shoulders. He was a huge figure. So when he would have been dressed in his mail, armor, his boots, his helmet and full war gear, he must have been a terrifying figure to his enemies and a source of inspiration to his men. And he probably would have been known. His enemies would have known it was him because he appears to have been one who led from the front, but his unusual height would mark him out. We know that he was a lifelong defender of religious communities and he was a generous patron to the church. His men fought for Essex, for England and for God, and they clearly had a great amount of trust in their Lord. So look, I've mentioned it a few times now, but loyalty to one's Lord was the overriding value or virtue in Anglo-Scandinavian society. The Lords gave gifts and protection, and in return, the follower gave a sacred oath of service. And it was this um, relationship that was meant to bind all levels of society, those societies together from the lowest, a churl, churl or freeman, all the way up to the king, or at least it was meant to. So now we come to the battle itself, the poem's account. Now the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle um, tells us that the Viking army was led by a man called it, who it refers to as Anlaf, which is probably synonymous with Oleg Tri Olaf Tryggvason, who was a famed Viking warlord. So the Vikings disembark from their ships and they gather at the causeway. And the only connection between the island that they are on and the mainland is a very narrow tidal causeway, which is covered at high tide. You can see from the map on the screen, salt marsh makes the rest of it unpassable. So the Vikings demand tribute, after which they would leave, pay us and we'll go away, they say. And Britnoth treats this offer with scorn. He grasped his shield and brandished his slender ashen spear, the poet says. Resentful and resolute, he shouted this reply. Can you hear me, pirate, what these people say? They will pay you a tribute of whistling spears of deadly darts and proven swords. Rebuffed by this, the Norsemen try to rush across the causeway, but they become easy prey for javelins and arrows. Britnoth sends forward a, a trusted man, Wolfstan, who is called the bravest of brave kin, to guard the narrow crossing with two more followers. And with his spear, he pierced the first seafarer. Nothing could have forced them those Englishmen to take flight. The Vikings then resort to guile. So their vanguard is lying dead in shallow water. Olaf sends a messenger across the causeway to ask that they be allowed to cross over unhindered and engage in a pitched battle. Britnoth's next decision proved to be decisive. He chose to allow them across. He sends this message. He's, the poet says, now the way is clear for you. Come over to us quickly, warriors, to the slaughter. God alone can say he will control the field of battle. And we find here the poet is deliberately referencing the words of Beowulf before his fight with Grendel. In, the, um, in that poem, the father in his wisdom shall apportion the honours, the all holy Lord, to whichever side shall seem to him fit. Both Britnoth and the poet would have been aware of that poem. 
and the poet deliberately frames Britnos in the mode of the legendary monster slayer. I'll talk about uh, Britnos motives um, in a few minutes, but regardless of the whys and the wherefores, battle is joined almost immediately. At the time, though mounted combat was not unheard of, the battlefield was still primarily the preserve of the infantrymen with spear and shield. So Meldon became a colossal melee. The shield wall of the English would form up, the shields and the javelins, uh, the javelins and the axes fly, and the armies advance to to uh, to meet. And they crash together. And for a time, the poet uh, paints a picture of a battle that rages without any real clear um, kind of upper hand being gained by anyone. They sent their spears hard as files, and darts ground sharp, flying from their hands. Bowstrings were busy, shield parried point, bitter the battle. Brave men fell on both sides, choking in dust. Britnoth's nephew is killed in the fighting, but he was avenged. The Vikings were repaid in full kind. Britnoth then shouts encouragement to his warriors, and he leads a charge straight into the heart of the enemy formation. He deflects spear and sword with his shield, his spear pierces many. He pushes forward, he shouts encouragement again, and given his experience in combat and his massive physical stature, he cleaves the enemy ranks with a ferocious skill. His men go with him, they charge with him, believing that victory is within their grasp. But, un but unfortunately, tragedy strikes. The poet records that one of the seafarers sent a sharp javelin speeding from his hand. It pierced the body of Earl Britnoth, Ethelred's brave thane. And in this moment, the English warrior Wolfmare, a thane of um, Britnoth, pulls the spear from his stricken lord and hurls it back, slaying the assailant. Britnoth struggle, struggles to his feet again, pulls his ornate sword from its uh, broad scabbard and prepares to defend himself, but it seems that destiny has turned against him. A Viking hacks at his arm and the sword drops to the sand. Surrounded by his foes and mortally wounded, Britnoth, in the words of the poet, offers a last resounding word. He entreats his soul to God. And then the heathens hewed him down, and two men supporting him, Elfnoth and Wolfmere, fell to the dust. Both gave their lives in defence of their lord. And one can only imagine the horror of the English forces to see this, their mighty lord, struck down. Now it's at this critical juncture when the morale of the English army hangs in the balance that elements of the English army flee and their leaders commit the most heinous offence in the Anglo-Saxon heroic code. They abandon their lord. The poet tells us that Godrich fled from the battle forsaking Britnoth, forgetting how often his lord had given him the gift of a horse. He leapt into the saddle of his lord's own horse most unlawfully and both his brothers galloped beside him. So the poet tellingly uses the image of a generous lord. Horses were expensive, an expensive commodity, especially ones trained for war. To contrast with a faithless follower who uses the horse of his own stricken lord to escape. The wings of the, the flanks of the English army collapse, the shield wall gives way and the Vikings close in. The poet contrasts um, the cowardice of those that ran with the devotion and the love of those that stay. The brave men hastened eagerly. They all wished then for one of two things, to avenge their Lord or to leave this world. The last section of the poem, though clearly hyperbolic, is a staring account of this last stand. And many of the warriors are mentioned by name. And they form this ever shrinking cordon around Britnoth's body. And they fight until the last of them are killed. And um, this section of the poem is the longest. And, and young and old veterans and levy soldiers alike uh, expend their own lives around Britnoth. One warrior is called Edward the Tall. Eager and ready, he did not stray from the line of battle. He boasted that he would not shrink so much as a footstep or seek safety by flight. He smashed the shield wall and attacked the seafarers until he worthily avenged his ring giver's death. He stole his life dearly in the storm. This ferocious onslaught drives the raiders back for a time, but in the end, it just becomes a numbers game. One by one, they fall until, in the words of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, the Vikings had possession of the place of slaughter. Night falls. The wide beach is piled with the dead and the wounded, stained black 
and littered with fallen weapons and helmets and shields. The battle is done. So Britnoff's decision to allow the uh, Viking army across, kind of bring this defeat on himself has been heavily criticized by generations of scholars. Um, there's more than a touch of the armchair, armchair general in their analysis, I think. Uh, it's so difficult not to judge great battles looking back by their outcome because the outcomes are so familiar to us. Ethendun, Brunaba, Agincourt, Cressy, Trafalgar, Talavera, Rorksdrift, Jutland, the Hunt for the Bismarck. These victories may well have been failures if the circumstances had been different or if different men had made different decisions. Unlike a 21st century audience, Britnoth didn't know he was going to lose. And a key consideration, I think, is often overlooked in um, analysing his, his attitude because as an experienced soldier, he would know how the Vikings fight. And if they could not win an easy victory, they would withdraw to their ships and use superior mobility to further inflict uh, plunder and misery on undefended targets. So in Brutnoth's eyes, he had this one opportunity to destroy the tormentors shield to shield, and he took it. And one, you can, I think you can understand that motivation and I think there's also another, for him, there's another element at play in that he wants to show the kind of the uh, fops and the hangers on at court, how a real elderman fights. In his own words, giving a tribute of sharp English steel, not good English coin. Uh, it's indeed arguable that if Britnoth had survived and his flanks of his army probably wouldn't have collapsed and it might have been a victory, but that is, that's what if history. So now I want to just kind of um, focus in on one particular vital word on which a lot of this hinges. And the word for his attitude is the old English word overmod. And it's troubled translators for centuries because it doesn't occur very often in old English literature. So it, um, so we, they can't, translators can't really compare it to much else. Um, it's usually translated as something like pride or overconfidence. After the Vikings call across the water to be allowed to cross, the sentence in Old English is, Thus it all on yan, for is all varmoda, alivan landas to fela, dara dioda. And it's translated as, and then the earl in his pride allowed the invaders too much land, something like that. It usually uh, reflects on Britnoth displaying too much courage and losing sight of the bigger picture. J.R.R. Tolkien, who was a renowned scholar of early medieval languages, follows this kind of translation, writing that Britnoth was magnificent, perhaps, but certainly wrong in his decision. However, I hold to a, a different uh, argument that is given, although I always hesitate to disagree with Tolkien, of all people. But I believe the Elderman showed too much confidence, not in himself, but in his men, I think perhaps blinded to the fatalism and the changing attitudes in England that were already sp spreading because of the decisions of Ethelred. Britnoth assumed that all his men, all his followers, would display the valour and dignity of his household guard, who proved faithful to him. And I think given the immediate context of those lines, where we've just had this display of strength by his thanes that forced the Vikings to seek for passage, that's a much more likely interpretation to me, but I could be wrong. The battle's significance was a sort of historical irony. Following the defeat at Maldon, Ethelred and his council, his Witan, they became fatally hesitant to engage Viking armies in open battle. And it marks the beginning of the infamous, the Danegeld payments. Um, this, this policy of paying raiders to leave. In this case, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle records that 10,000 pounds of silver and gold, meaning a lot of that, meaning literally in weight, was paid to the Viking army to leave England's shores and to never return. 
The one version um, of the Anglo of the Chronicle even records that Ethelred stood sponsor for Olaf at a Christian confirmation ceremony. However, the respite was a brief one because to the Vikings, this policy demonstrated one thing. England wasn't strong enough to fight them, but it was wealthy enough to pay them. Now, Ethelred is not the first king to use this and um, defenders of Ethelred often point out that Alfred the Great himself paid the Viking raiders Danegeld payments to leave. But I think the key difference is that Alfred always had something else up his sleeve. He was developing to one towards a greater plan he was buying time so that he could achieve his armies could train and recover that he could achieve something else but uh, uh, ethelred really had no ace up his sleeve he was he became increasingly fighting fires so in the two decades following maldon the situation escalated wildly out of control larger and larger payments were given off were given to ward off larger and larger incursions english and scandinavian armies as well as hosts of mercenaries marched across England's shires, burning and stealing as they went, and the country just eventually devolved into a strange combination of invasion and civil war. Alliances were made and broken as Ethelred, now awake too late to the consequences of earlier uh, decisions, tries to control the situation. But 25 years after Britnoth's death, the country is completely invaded by Svein Forkbeard, and his son, Canute, who would himself become famous as a king of England. So internal and external evidence shows that this poem was composed very soon after the battle, probably we're talking about only a few years, and its ultra typical style and its veneration of the traditional values, these heroic values is obvious. It's hyperbolic, you know, it's idealized, it's, it's warrior poetry, it's, it's got this kind of um, it's got an epic flavour to it, but it seems authentic. Um, the theme, especially of loyalty, as I've mentioned, typified by the warrior who states the lines that have become famous, mind must be the firmer, heart the more fierce. Courage the greater as our strength diminishes. Here lies our leader hewn down, a heroic man to the dust. I will not go from here, but I mean to lie in the dust with the man I loved so dearly. And it says much of Britnoth that he inspired such unwavering loyalty in his men. And amid such powerful poetic language and the kind of clash of armies and all these political overtones, it's easy to forget that these were all real people. An aged and senior elderman like Britnoth would have known his household and soldiers for many years. He would know their families, he would know their farms, their lives, he would have made um, judgments and rulings on their behalf, he would have adjudicated family disputes as the elderman. They would have served alongside each other in the shield wall, feasted together. And the poet counts on this knowledge on the part of his audience as well to make this poem's emotional impact fully felt. As a sort of side note as well, the poem is also an example of a key difference between culture so broadly speaking, the Norse or Scandinavian uh, culture at this time thought it fitting to laugh at death. And Tom Shippey has written an excellent exploration of this topic, a book called Laughing Shall I Die, which is really worth reading. Um, and it explores this idea of laughing at death and having the last laugh. But for the Anglo-Saxons, the most lauded martial value is a kind of stern resolve in the face of death, unflinching with only the most kind of ironical ruefulness as a mode of comedy. The poet is at pains to highlight this, and many of his phrases, his phrases typify um, the Lord and retainer's words as they face their end. It's also, I think, highly likely that the poem's deliberately heroic style, like really kind of amping the epic up um, to 11, is meant to be, it's meant to be a rebuke to the confused, politically charged court of the king and his cronies, who would rather let brave eldermen die and pay raiders to leave rather than take the field themselves. The form of the poem as well, in the mode of this heroic last stand, you know, there's even films being made today about the heroic last stand. It's, a, it's, an, it's an almost eternal motif. It allows the poet 
to demonstrate all these values in a, a very you might call a pure setting an un unalloyed setting as the heroic defender has no wider strategic or political concerns in that moment The poem is also remarkable for, like a lot of literary works, what is not said as well as what is said. The poem makes a marked point of ridiculing the idea of tribute payment. So Britnoth and his captains make a joke of it, this famous jest about the tribute of spears. But there is not, hardly any mention of the king. And in an age of kind of Christian warrior kings, this is unthinkable. And it must only have been a deliberate snub. He regards the king, Ethelred with such contempt that he is not even worthy to be uh, in the same poem as these heroes. God is often praised and mentioned, the strong Christian faith of this culture, but Ethelred is less than a footnote. Uh, he's mentioned once or twice, but only in reference to um, Britnoth as his brave thane. And of course, we, we do lack the complete manuscript, um, but his absence from the majority we have is telling. In battle, these exhausted warriors call on the name of God and Britnoth, but not their king. And the poet's use of his, uh, the king's title simply underlines how the king has failed. Even as the earl's men, Britnoth's men, prepare to die with him. And there's also a very interesting geographical, geographical consideration that is... Um, that is extremely damning for Ethelred. London, his capital at that time, because by that time the capital was quite fixed, um, or more fixed than at, uh, earlier in history, is only 50 miles from Meldon. It was the middle of summer. Uh, the roads were well frequented. It was the time of year when travel was the easiest. Mustering medieval armies took time, but the king could call on a large following of experienced warriors at short notice, more than enough to support Britain's force. So, he, so it takes only two days, say, for an army to reach from London to Meldon, and that's at a standard marching pace. They also had advance warning because Britnoth had been tracking these Vikings for some days and would have been in contact, I presume, with support forces. So where was the king? The Chronicle, interestingly, offers no commentary on the absence. But uh, so to judge kind of historical events, is always difficult, um, especially when confronted with them through the lens of poetry or literature that has a point to make. But the Battle of Meldon is a unique literary work. It marks the first recorded battle site in English history. Uh, it's one of the first where we know exactly when and where it happened. Um, the poet's skill has created a stirring, a fierce, detailed recreation of what happened, but also an elegy for a world that was ending within a lifetime the world of Britnoth would be replaced first by the Anglo-Scandinavian reign of Canute uh, after his father's short reign, then by the continental court of Edward the Confessor, and finally by the coming of Duke William and the Norman feudal monarchy. However, aside from the immortality of the poem, Britnoth has also achieved a legacy in the works of Tolkien, whom I mentioned earlier. Tolkien's love and his knowledge of the Anglo-Saxon world and its values impressed him deeply. And much of his fictional work in The Lord of the Rings is redeeming what he saw as wasted or detrimental to the Anglo-Saxon spirit. So in Theoden, uh, King of Rohan, we have the idealized, kind of almost redeemed Britnoth. He is a warrior who, like Britnoth, is of advancing years, but he's still a great warrior. And when the Rohirrim, who are the kind of mounted Anglo-Saxon warriors of Tolkien's imagining, come to the rescue of the besieged city of Minas Tirith, uh, Tolkien writes that Theoden sees the agony of Minas Tirith, as if stricken suddenly by anguish or by dread. They were too late. Perhaps Theoden would quail, bow his old head and slink away. But like Britnoth in the fray, the bent shape of the king sprang suddenly upright, tall and proud he seemed again. Suddenly the king cried to Snowmane and the horse sprang away. Morning came, morning and a wind from the sea, and the hosts of Mordor wailed and terror took them. And all the host of Rohan burst into song and they sang as they slew. 
in this action, Theoden achieves glory but is slain in the process. But just like Britnoth, just as in the epic poem Beowulf, a young warrior refuses to abandon the body of his lord and fights the kind of terrible foe of the Witch King. And Peter Jackson's um, successful film versions of The Lord of the Rings are uh, really do a good job of capturing this. And in The Return of the King, he has Theoden speak a line which is not in the book, but I think it perfectly kind of encapsulates the spirit of Britnoth as we see him through the poem. So see, his senior captains come to the King Theoden on the eve of the battle and they say, too few have come. We cannot defeat the armies of Mordor. And Theoden's reply could have been lifted straight from the Battle of Maldon. Well, he says, no, we cannot, but we will meet them in battle nonetheless. And ultimately, uh, Tolkien has the Rohirrim, the free folk of Middle-earth. Um, they are successful in their struggle against evil. Theoden is vindicated in his courage, in his overmod, his belief in his warriors. And that really brings um, this talk to a close. I can recommend visiting the site. And um, thanks to the poet's description and the other sources, it's one of the few um, places in early medieval medieval England that has a real kind of precision attached to it. I mentioned my visit last year and you can look out over the courseway, you can stand there and you can see where it happened. Um, and it's now a National Trust property, um, but you can look out and you can see the, imagine the clustered longship masts on the other side of the island and hear the kind of rolling thunder of thousands of spear hafts being beaten on the backs of hundreds of shields, which is a kind of common tactic in that era to drum up the adrenaline and to intimidate the enemy but most of all i could say read the poem it's it's exhilarating it's brutal it's heroic and it's such an interesting window into um into that world that, I, that world that i love so much tolkien's own translation of it is being published this year and i'm looking forward to getting my my grubby mitts on that but it's available online for free in any number of translations or and ultimately, the poem's legacy is so powerful that Britnoth is commemorated as a warrior without peer, a lord for whom his people would willingly die, while his own lord is condemned to be remembered forever as the unready. Thank you for listening. And back to Bish. Thank you so much, Tim, for an excellent talk and such a stirring poem in it. As Tim's alluded to, if you haven't uh, read the poem yourself, I hope this talk has been inspiration for you to read it because it is a really, really stirring uh, poem. And also for inspiration to go and visit the site of the statue at Morden. As Tim said, I, I, it's uh, it's definitely worth a visit. The statue itself is really imposing on the landscape. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful walk along the sort of promenade, I guess you'd call it. Um, great if you've got a dog for a dog walk. It's just a really <laughs> nice walk. It, but you can definitely see that even the most casual of observer who's not really a, an avid history lover still is drawn to that to the end of the of the walk where you can see the statue you can read the plaque you can see the plinth as well so um i'm slightly biased as i'm a statue lover if you know <laughs> um, it's definitely well worth the visit so whilst tim um just catches his breath and has a short breather before our q a session please do um express your thanks in um to tim for this wonderful talk by liking this video if you don't already subscribe to history indoors please click that subscribe button um, and therefore you'll be able to see on your youtube feed every time we have a new talk and we've already got comments coming in the comments box um just expressing their thanks to you tim um Thank you. please Thank those you. very kind comments uh coming because it really was such an excellent talk um and Please do also, if you have any of those social media accounts, you see those social media buttons on the screen there, please do subscribe to us on, uh, follow us or subscribe to us on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. You can keep up on the latest developments of History Indoors there. So I'm just going to change that uh, slide there as well. <laughs> These are our um, next two talks that are coming up on History Indoors. Now, there might be one in between uh there but those are the ones that advertise at the moment so in two weeks time at slightly later time of eight o'clock we're still in uh, following the early medieval theme and i'll be talking um, about saint edmund 
um, king of uh, 9th century East Anglia and a, and a huge figure here in um, our homeland of Suffolk. <laughs> um, so if you are particularly interested in early medieval history or you're in East Anglia, please do um, sign up for that talk. And then our founder, Michael Saul, who'll be going back to his, um, I think he'd say it's his first love and enduring passion, which <laughs> is the English Civil War. And he's going to be looking at the legacy of the siege of Colchester in 1648. So these next two talks, keeping it nice and local, because our roots are the universe, uh, are Essex and um, East Anglia. We broadened out in our uh, speaker base to around the world now, but our original speakers were all from the University of Essex. Um, if you'd like to sign up for those talks or to see any other talks that we've got um, coming up, before our August break, we always have a short uh, month break in, in August, please do scan that QR code there if you've got a phone handy, um, or you can just search Eventbrite History Indoors or our website historyindoors.co.uk that's coming up on the banner um, at the bottom of the screen. So please do leave any questions that you have for Tim and um, we'll endeavour to ask them to him. But as speaker, I always have the, the prerogative to ask the first <laughs> question to him. So, we actually had a comment from Sylvia, and she uh, mentioned that um, looking at her ancestry, that Ethelred the Unready is not only her 25th great grandfather, <laughs> but also 26th great uh, uncle. So, wow. my first question that I, I sort of had even before the talk is you, you know, Tim's, you, you kind of, there are certain topics in history that are. You know, there's been a long-standing opinion on a certain individual or a mm. certain subject and then you sort of get maybe more revisionist history historians come along and say actually you know that person that we thought was great let's look at the other side of them or that person we thought was not so great let's let's look at the other side of them you know it's not so one-dimensional i know i've read recently a biography of george iii and he's been much maligned in history as mm. the as the mad monarch who <laughs> lost the north american colonies but there's some kind of looking at actually, you know, is, is there another side to that? So on that theme, Tim, King Ethelred dubbed the unready, as you said, the bad, the badly counselled. Was he really all that bad? Um, or um, is there is there a more positive side? Has history been unkind to him or has history been um, faithful to, to him? That's something that I've offered in this period. I've thought quite a lot about and i i used to have the i suppose you call the standard opinion bad king uh, as uh sellers and yateman would say a bad king capital b capital k um i've read a bit more about him um i think ultimately he should not he was just a man who was he should not have been king he in many I think in many junctures in his life, he wanted to do the right thing, but he didn't know how to do it. Um, he he was very much in the shadow of about a hundred years of uh, obviously he had that line back to Alfred, who took the throne in eight seven one, and so almost so it was almost a century later, Ethelred takes the throne, and it's been an almost unbroken chain of success. Uh, men and, and in Ethelfled's case, were a woman of vision, passion, drive, wisdom, skill in battle, skill diplomatically. I just don't think he, he should have been king. I, he strikes me as someone who had his, his flaws and his vices, like we all do, but um, our flaws and vices, I think, are more forgivable uh, in the light of history because we don't command nations. And at the beginning of his reign, he was very much, I think, under the influence of his mother and of a very split Witan. And he had some real uh, snakes whispering in his ears. And he wanted to do the right thing. He wanted to be remembered as, as a pious king. Um, like his, But he was also involved, they don't know how directly, in the death of his predecessor. Because it had one of those situations that often happens in Anglo-Saxon history where two reign together and then one dies very, very quickly. And <laughs> it's, it's probably, oh, it's, it's a good old chance that his mother was the uh, active agent, shall we say, in removing the opposition. Uh, how, he, how much he was involved, historians don't know. 
I think particularly at the end of his reign, he actually wanted to do the right thing. But yeah, I, he just he was just a man ill fitted to be king. And by that time, the damage was done. So there's this so there's this moment where he he assembles, I think, in the ports of Kent, this enormous fleet and a colossal army to make this this um, I think it's against Swain um, when he's landed in England. But it's this enormous army, this enormous armada, nothing like it had been seen. He'd spent money like water to build all these ships. Uh, but he, he delays too long to engage. The army starts to fall apart. It starts to fracture. Ships are wrecked in storms and that just melts away. And that's like, and it's almost a picture of his reign. He tries to do the right thing, but does the wrong thing. He has, he has almost what you might call noble intention, but he just cannot. He is just not a man who should have been king. Really interesting. Listening to you say that, Tim, there seems to be some parallels with um, his son, Edward the Confessor, mm. you know, who wanted to be pious, but maybe was, depending on what way you view history or that time mm. period, potentially poorly counseled, or that he, he at least. He's the, almost the opposite side of the history scale. He's remembered as a kind of a magnificently pious king, but actually. Well, this is this is the thing, you know. That he he's kind mm. of even if you wouldn't ascribe that he's poorly counselled, he's at least counselled by uh, people from Normandy that yeah, contemporary very, very continental king. Yeah, that contemporaries questioned um, his counsel and his decisions regarding Godwin. Um, mm. But like you say, Tim, he's it, history's remembered him as the confessor, and for a very long time he was considered a patron saint of England. Like yeah. I wonder how much of that is potentially a uh fitting into a norman yoke theory of, of history or maybe a, you know the, the legacy of william the conqueror but oh, that's yeah, a separate talk. that is a separate talk which i am endeavoring to bring in, in october this <laughs> around the time of the anniversary oh, of the yeah. i was hoping to um uh, give that talk last year but i think hopefully mm. this year i'll be in a uh, place to, to oh, bring that um so uh, another just uh, Sylvia said brilliant talk. Thank you. So more. Thank you, Sylvia. There. Thank you very much for your kind comments, Sylvia. So um, we haven't received any questions so far from the audience. So I'll I'll, I'll talk the questions at the moment, Tim. So you mentioned about the translation that from mm -hmm. uh, Tolkien that's going to be uh, published this year. And actually, I think it was published back in March with a beautiful. Oh cover and it's the first time that the translation of the battle of Malden, tolkien's translation has been mm. published alongside his almost sequel which is amazing <laughs> uh, all, all, all great works of literature you either hope there's going to be a sequel or if there's no sequel, people write fan fiction about uh, <laughs> tolkien himself wrote that the tolkien wrote the homecoming of Bjorn. Mm. um have you read it tim I have, yeah, though, a long time ago when I uh, studied Tolkien for my degree and uh, I haven't, haven't actually read it since then, but it's a very funny flick through in reference, but it's a very yeah, powerful piece. Okay, he got it. So Tolkien understood it at that time. So that's just another little bit of advertisement. We've got nothing to do <laughs> with it, but uh, if you would like to have that, you know, to, to not just have the Battle of Morden, but Tolkien mm. sort of sequel uh, to it and that is available now to buy. I think it was published back in March with it, I must say it's a beautiful front cover I think I, mean, I wouldn't have been tempted to buy it but the front, the front cover alone is just <laughs> oh, go and check it out on uh, any yes. book they've done, they've done well there um, so Tim thinking about uh, what you said about the poem itself that we're missing basically the bookend we're missing hmm. the beginning yeah. of the poem and we're missing the end um, yeah. have historians, uh, linguists, even Tolkien maybe himself, kind of supposed what would have been in those missing fragments. And if not, or if so, um, are there hopes that one day an archaeologist or somebody will stumble upon those fragments to give the fullest uh, version of the poem? Ooh, you know? Take your first question. Um, I, not that I'm aware of. I don't think anyone's attempted to supply almost like to fill in the blanks, uh, as it were. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me if one of the, the, the worthies of history had done so. I, I live in hope that they find uh, copies of manuscripts because it does happen. Um, private libraries, um, 
do sometimes crop up and we do still find things from um, copies of things that we didn't know we had, is still extant or, or surviving. And that's, that's the Holy Grail, is to find a complete copy because it's my suspicion that the poet would have begun it in exactly the same way as Beowulf does because Beowulf begins with the uh, quet, the sort of listen, and then it describes uh, the shieldings and their prowess, you know, the record of the taker of meat benches and all that. And I think this is completely unverifiable. This is just my, this is just my chinny reckons, but I think that he would have begun with a similar treatment of Britnoth and said, you know, this was his life born in da da da, son of so and so, done this, done that. And then at the end, I think there probably would have been a quite a cutting um, examination of lordship, kingship, God's favour and grace um, and the way he worked in destiny and that kind of thing. And I think those would have been the bookends. Oh, how fascinating. Wouldn't it be amazing one day if, if, if it is stumbled upon what a, a great My Christian? Love. I wonder if you'll mention King Athelred in those missing missing lives at all. I I'd probably in the end of it by uh in by almost um by bad comparison by comparing britain off to him and to god because they very much they in they envision envisioned um the world and the natural world as sort of the divine order of kings that it would be sort of later called or the nat the divine order i can't remember from my uni days what it was called but this sort of great pyramid of god king elderman thane yeah like that natural order yeah um so we've got a couple more comments so sylvia uh says it was definitely his mother who killed edward the martyr at Corf castle yeah that is definitely a kind of uh that says that's an almost like five percent chance that she didn't do it yeah so we've got Not really good, good question by simon here so simon uh mentions that levi roach's book on ethelred is a really good read and uh, Lee Burroughs suggests that Ethelred tries to repeat the solutions of the past to combat the Viking raids. I imagine one of those solutions might be the, the Dane girl pay, paying off the Danes that you mentioned, Tim. Um, do you, Tim, do you think that was a mistake for um, Ethelred to try and repeat past strategies and solutions? Did, did, it, did a different, different time, 100 years later, call for different solutions against the Vikings? I think I've read that um, book and yeah, it's a really good one. Very, very, um, it's good because Levi wrote, doesn't go too far. He doesn't try and over egg the pudding. Um, I think uh, in a word, yes. I think that again, I thought he wanted to do the right thing and he looked to the achievements of Alfred, of Edward, of Ethelfled, Ethelstan. He looked at their achievements and tried to emulate them, but the world was totally changed. Um, it, it was a, it was a very different European setting, um, and Alfred uh, was coping with a very different uh, problem. I think it was the same enemy, but it was a very different problem. Um, and Ethelred didn't have the uh, that sort of dominating will of wisdom, you would call it maybe, that his forebears had had. So I think yeah, that was a mistake to try and almost relive the glory days. And again, badly counselled those people who could have told him, I think, that we need a different approach, probably weren't listened to, were pushed out of court. Uh, yeah, so that's a good that's a good question. And that is a very, I recommend that book. It's really good. Makes me think of a football analogy, if you know. I know you're not a big football fan, Tim. <laughs> listening to this, uh, Leeds United turned to Sam Allardyce to save them in the Premier League. But Sam Allardyce was a manager who could do that maybe 10, 15 years ago. But turning yeah. to it in this modern day and age just, just didn't work and it, it kind of failed miserably. It just made me think of that turning to old solutions. Prior wisdom sometimes yeah. does count, but you kind of have to repackage it to the to the demands and demands of the day. I well, wonder um, if, I'm sorry? Oh, no, you, you go on, Tim. I was just going to say that the late and great Tim Keller defined wisdom as competence regarding the complex realities of life. And I think that's what Ethelred lacked. He lacked wisdom. Oh, that's quite beautiful. I wonder if it, the sort of the ethnic makeup of, of England by that point of, you know, this, you know, those Scandinavian mm -hmm. 
to who had settled in the kind of preceding century. I wonder if that had anything to do with it again, a different thing. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, the, the and then he does yeah. he does things which are just baffling to me. Like oh, this in Bryce's Day Massacre, you just think what and that I think that was for the way that Levi Roach paints that is that it was almost I think lashing out. He just become so desperate and, and tired of this. He that he thought if he could display a strong hand and just come down like like you know like his grandfather had done or his great grandfather had done, then he he would sort of stabilise the situation. But just flailing in the dark, I think by then. Um, well, whilst I ask this next question that's sort of been burning in my mind, if anybody does have any other questions, please do uh, put them in the in the comments box. Uh, we've definitely got a few few more minutes. Uh, to, to grill Tim. So, um, Tim, when I was, I was just kind of musing on on the Battle of Malden, and when you were talking about that that phrase, uh, of, of a mod, uh, of that, a mod, yeah, yeah, of, of a mod, yeah, perhaps you know, being translated as maybe too much pride or or too much courage. Maybe think mm. of Harold Robinson at the Battle of Hastings, and sort of that benefit mm. of hindsight thinking. You know, if if Harold hadn't rushed down. To, to confront William in that sort of all or nothing battle, or or if he'd yeah. send him instead, or if he take if we tried to starve William out, or just like all that you know hypothetical thinking that some historians mm. hate, but I kind of I do. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I, I love a hypothetical question or what if question. Um, do you see parallels between kind of Britain's sort of um, heroic last stand, his maybe over zealous courage? To confront the Vikings in sort of Harold Godwinson's similarly sort of maybe in hindsight too much courage to fight William and maybe if he'd taken a step back to to, to think maybe things could have been different or am I just sort of overstretching in my in my hope to, to find a, an apt comparison? Well, I'll say that Earl Godwin, he's one of these people, and and his the the, the family of Godwin. I, I want to read more about them because I'm getting really interested in them, but. I would say just on the knowledge I have that I don't think that's too ridiculous a comparison, especially because you've got Stamford Bridge, which he wins with a very kind of aggressive, um, you also might call it an old fashioned battle um, using um, the big book of Anglo-Saxon defeating the Viking tactics kind of thing he wins it in the old-fashioned way in the anglo-saxon martial way and so i think i don't think that's a fanciful comparison i think he i don't know it's something i don't know really really well i've not studied it in a lot of depth but there is an idea that hastings um where maldon was a kind of uh, uh, a marker of an old world dying away politically or socially Hastings was an old world dying away militarily um, because and which I've heard that you know the Normans made great use of cavalry and dedicated missile infantry as we sort of more recognize it on a medieval battle field um, and Harold had those things but obviously they, they used cavalry for skirmishing for reconnaissance but uh, he still subscribed basically basically that it was the it was the infantryman the shield um bearer and shield and spear was was the kind of heart the beating heart of his army and the way the anglo-saxons uh the heart of their tactics and strategy so yeah i don't think that's a fanciful comparison and i wonder whether it's telling of sort of the way history played out that you know it's often a cliche that history is written by the victors and so <laughs> Yes. Battle of Hastings was sort of with the Bone mm. Tapestry and, and sort Very of much. writing uh, the history. Of that. However, after Malden, it's actually it's the yeah. it losing. I wonder if it's just because it's a, a Viking raid, it's not a Viking conquest, or whether it's the fact that when Canute, for example, eventually does become king, it's mm. Gandalf is on the throne. Whether there's more of a conciliatory approach with the English, there's a there's a more shared culture. It's less of a, a conquest and more mm -hmm. of a you know just a, a a different king, different genealogy. However, a bit more continuity than than what happened with you know a totally new line with with, with William. I think that's very true about Meldon. Um, because one of Canute's he was a he's a fascinating guy. 
because one of his big challenges when he took the throne was, yeah, that he had this kingdom that was absolutely at each other's throats. They'd had, under Athelred, they had year, decades of war and raiding. Um, he was a very, very clever, politically astute guy. And I think, yeah, he probably, I think, well, there's even evidence that he promoted a lot of Anglo-Saxon literature, Scandinavian literature together. And he, he did a very clever thing where he would, uh, there was this network in England of earldoms, of eldermans, and he very much created a patchwork. So one shire would be controlled by one of his Norse lords, next door would be an Anglo-Saxon, an English lord next door of Norse, and an English, this great patchwork so that no one could amass a power base to use against any other part of the country. And so he managed to balance all these plates. Um, so I think, yeah, probably Meldon the poem probably did come to prominence in his reign because it's in his interest to see the previous dynasty mm. as yeah we got rid of them thank goodness um, so i wouldn't be surprised if it was almost a court poem in the in yeah. the london of Kenyat. whereas william pursued the policy of rewarding his norman yeah and so his, that was all his chums wasn't it <laughs> um so Tim, as we kind of wrap things up my my last question for you Tim, and it may be rhetorical um oh. i think i've asked you this um off camera before um but and if you don't know tim is entering a very exciting period of life he's going to become father soon god willing um <laughs> so we won't see tim sort of in front of the camera for a little while in history indoors although um tim's going to ramp up the behind the scenes <laughs> involved in history yes. indoors and i've got an admin side which is fantastic but tim when you um return from the just the busyness of being a parent and you're ready to give your next history indoors talk um mm -hmm. might be on and i'm sure people might want to suggest some comments in the comments box if they're familiar with your past talk but what would you like to give it a talk on that just to whet people's appetites of what what is to come oh there's tons i mean my my big interest is anglo-saxon all things uh yeah norse and anglo-saxon but also um maritime history kind of the age of sail going into the world wars so i'd like to pr talk about oh, i don't know there's loads it's just hundreds of topics uh, to talk about something like the hunt for the bismarck or Scharnhorst, or the battle of the atlantic or even something like uh, um exploring a bit more old english literature uh, something like the wanderer or beowulf or some of the religious literature because it's just it's just incredible uh, richness of literature that we have from that time and it's gaining more momentum now and a bit more prowess and i'd like to be part of spreading that and you mentioned canute to me the other day didn't you ah yes uh, that's a talk i'd probably like to do is canute because when you take on one of these talks it forces you to, to kind of sharpen up what you sort of think you sort of know and you have to actually read the books and sharpen it all up and yeah i'd love to talk about can you fascinating guy uh, he had a very good approach to uh i mentioned in the talk a man called edric uh, strayona uh, names uh, translates as strife and he was uh, really a perfidious real piece of work and he was an elderman i believe of mercia or he was an earl of mercia i think under thored but he changed sides, um, like I changed yes, stocks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was. It was. He was a, just an opportunist. He betrayed everyone, and then um, he was very ambitious. And Canute said to these famous words. Canute said to him, "Come then to my capital. Come to London, and I shall, I shall put you higher than any elderman in the kingdom." And so, uh, Adric comes to London confident of promotion of more favors and Canute has his guards drag and drink out the back of the palace hacks off his head and sticks it right on top of London Bridge higher than any other elderman and it's just Canute had this real he knew when to be brutal but also when to be very very savvy and I yeah fascinating guy it'd be a great bridge between talks as well tim because this one even though it was about britain after it also featured heavily ethel red mm, and yeah. you know this is a bit of a shameless plug but it would complement <laughs> beautifully my talk on emma of normandy who was oh, the yeah. wife of ethel red but also um wife of canute as well so that would be mm. a, a really nice bridging between them okay Tim. well i uh, get you off the hot seat now thank you so much for your talk today tim it's been brilliant thank you for answering so many questions 
Um, thank you to the audience as well for your kind comments and for your comments and questions as well. And just for the last time, please do remember to, uh, if you haven't already, to like this video. It just helps it gain a bit more prominence on YouTube so more people can, can watch it. Uh, please do subscribe to us on YouTube. Please do follow us on those other social media channels. And then if you're interested in those next two talks, the one in two weeks' time about St. Edmund, delivered by myself, and the next talk after that, the 11th of July, about the siege of Colchester by, uh, in the Civil War by uh, Michael Saul, please do scan that QR code or visit our website, historyindoors.co.uk, to sign up. But um, alas, our time is up. So, Tim, a huge thank you. Um, no, thank you, everyone. It's uh, always nice to have a receptive audience i'm not going mad <laughs> and audience thank you very much as well from myself and we hope to see you um in two weeks time at our next talk thank you everybody mm -hmm.